right, welcome back, welcome back. I I am finally back after uh, kind of a long delay there. Had kind of a weird summer, actually. I had expected to do a lot more episodes this summer and maybe less episodes this fall, but it may be flip-flopped. I may be doing less episodes this summer and more episodes this fall. I typically, just as a person who is somewhat creative, I tend to do more writing in the fall. And and I was hoping to do maybe another book this fall. But who knows, maybe I'll do more podcasting, more recording this fall. Um, it turns out that every time I've had kind of an open day to do my podcasting, my recording, I've got hit with some autopsies. And uh, it's been busy. It's been busy. So I've I've actually had a number of cases on days when I had set to do uh, episode five. And so, um, you know, here we are. I'm finally got an open day to do it and some time to do it. And I have no idea how long this is going to be, but today we are going to talk about, uh, helpful hints to avoid being autopsied. Now, before we get into that, I usually like to do kind of a recap or kind of answer questions from our last episode. I haven't really, um, had many questions from the last few episodes because it's been quite a long time since we had our last episode. Um, there's just been general questions and comments, uh, that I get, you know, messages and things like that. And, um, it's funny because a few people know me personally, I don't really have very many friends, but a few people that know me personally have said, uh, you know, Hey, you know, are you going to use more humor in your podcast? Because some people, um, you know, allege that I'm quote unquote funny or something like that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I guess maybe sometimes I'm funny, but I haven't, uh, I haven't found an edge to put humor in uh, to a lot of these things so far. Um, I'm not necessarily trying to make this uh stand up comedy routine, uh, for, for this podcast. I mean, I, I actually do like to do funny things. I, I like to do voices and I like to do some jokes and things like that. But, um, I've got this weird thing when it comes to death, when it comes to, uh, autopsies, bodies, anatomy, and things like that. I don't really joke around too much. Um, and people who went to med school with me know that I was, I did joke around a lot. Um, I, in high school, it was a complete mess and college is the same way. Um, anyone who knows me know, knows that I did not take things very seriously. Um, and, um, I don't know, one of my favorite movies is that movie Real Genius with, with Val Kilmer. If you've never seen this movie, um, it is a classic. It's from 1985. And anyway, it's called Real Genius. Val Kilmer's the main character. His name's Chris Knight in the movie. And he's like a physics genius. And it's seriously one of my favorite movies. And so for some reason, and I was a little kid when I saw that movie, I sort of modeled my entire academic career after Chris Knight. And so that's pretty much me, um, but maybe less cool than Chris Knight. And um, so I, but you know, when it comes to like my professional career, I'm not that silly. Like when I'm doing an autopsy, I'm not trying to cut up very much. And I, I'll tell you why that, that has come to pass in this way, because whenever I read a book or whenever I see a podcaster or whenever I see a, somebody doing on Twitter and they're in that the death field or, or they're talking about death or writing about death, it's always got to be puns. It's always got to be funny and it's always got to be uh, I'm making a joke about a dead body. And honestly, it's a little tiresome to me. Uh, I, I, I feel like maybe it's a little more serious than that. And I feel like, um, some of the people who did it like 10 or 15 years ago that wrote books and did some things like that were really kind of funny and edgy. And, and now it's just, it's a little bit worn. And so I'm trying to teach people about, you know, uh, the really the substance of death. Remember we talked about that a few episodes ago and I'm trying to get people to understand kind of like 
really a lot more about biological science, about medical science and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, I think my humor will come through a little more. Um, I might have other opportunities, maybe in other projects that I do, um, but not, I don't know about this one. I, I guess it'll just kind of evolve naturally because most of these podcasts that I do, I do a really rough outline and then I just do it all in one take. I don't even, I don't do breaks or anything. One other thing we're going to, I wanted to talk about is that um, I actually don't know how many listeners I have, but apparently it's quite a few. And um, apparently after you get a certain amount, you can do advertisements. And, um, you know, I know I'm going to, I'm a corporate sellout now and all that stuff. No, but uh, apparently, you know, you can do advertisements. And so there may be advertisements um, on future podcasts and then retroactively, if somebody listens um, sometime in the future, they may put advertisements on the podcasts and I don't know when they will come during the podcast. I have absolutely no idea what the advertisements will be. I mean, of course I would like to, uh, you know, I would like to control that. I would, I don't want like political advertising for like politicians that I don't agree with and things like that, but we'll see how that goes. There may be a few advertisements coming in the future. Uh, it shouldn't be on this particular episode today because I don't have any of them planned. Now let's talk about how to avoid being autopsied. So first of all, let's talk about who gets autopsied. And I got this idea for this episode. It was kind of funny. I was talking to a friend, um, not really a friend, but more of an acquaintance who we lived in the same County and she knew that I did autopsies and we, we had had, we were kind of, um, we had the same friend group and I wasn't really friends with her, but we were friends with the same people. And she said, so if I die, you're, you're going to have to do my autopsy. And I said, well, I mean, if you die in, in a particular way, I might have to do your autopsy. And she says, well, you know, uh, please leave my clothes on. I don't want you to see me naked. And, uh, and I kind of laughed because I was like, well, um, I can't really do an autopsy with your clothes on. Like we have to take the clothes off. And of course me, I'm obviously being very serious, you know, um, because that's how I am when we start talking about autopsy. And, um, she was being, she was actually being very serious. She was like, no, I absolutely do not want anybody to look at me after death with my clothes off. And, um, so it got me thinking about, I, I think there are a lot of people who actually don't realize what happens in an autopsy process. And, you know, as we go over the autopsy, um, you know, we're going to go over it again and again and again. I mean, I, hopefully I'll have a few seasons of this podcast, um, but we're going to talk that not everybody gets autopsied. Um, but we're going to talk first today about who gets autopsied. And then we're going to talk about maybe, you know, like who, how you, how you can avoid that. And, uh, the, the first thing is not everyone gets autopsied. You have to understand that. And that there are two types of autopsies, two big types of autopsies. There's the clinical autopsy and there's the forensic autopsy. The clinical autopsy is like um, also known as the hospital-based autopsy. This is if you are in a ho hospital um, and you die in a hospital. The doctors can't figure out why you died, and then they confer with your family and they um, order an autopsy. They say, we don't know why your loved one died and we would like to know, so we want to order an autopsy. And then your loved ones say, well, we would like to know too, and we agree with that. Well, you know, that is not a very common thing nowadays. Um, back in the old days, um, and by the old days, we're talking, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, um, this was more than 50% of cases. Uh, more than 50% of hospital deaths were getting autopsied. Today, it's under 5%. And that may be an overestimate. Um, very often, these are cases that are um, very unexpected deaths, um, deaths that occur in um, medical procedures, um, uh, ones that are concerning for malpractice, and uh, those make everyone very tense because um, deaths do occur during procedure during procedures, but that doesn't mean that the doctor did something wrong. 
um, just because a death occurs during a procedure. But of course, that has to be ruled out. Uh, people have underlying medical conditions that predispose them to things like, you know, having cardiac arrhythmias or going into respiratory arrest and uh, having metabolic, um, you know, reactions that cause them to to go into arrest and die. And so the autopsy then will assess why that occurred. Um, and fortunately, deaths during procedures are not very common, but they are one of the reasons why a clinical autopsy is done. Of course, um, the other, you know, this was when I was in residency, you know, 15 years ago or something, um, an unexpected death, um, usually something like, let's say somebody goes in for a gallbladder surgery, uh, which is a pretty routine surgery. I mean, you know, those happen in every hospital in the country from little small country hospitals up through the big medical centers. Um, those happen every day all around the country. Um, person is recovering just fine. You know, they're, they're in the recovery area, they go to the floor, and then all of a sudden they go into what we call code blue. You know, they go into respiratory arrest and die. And so um, that would be, you know, a death occurring like after a procedure. And of course, again, we have to uh, do an autopsy sometimes. Well, usually, always, uh, when someone dies after a procedure to see why that occurred. Um, but see, as technology has grown... Um, in the medical field, we we don't do autopsies as much. Um, and, and by we, I'm talking about the medical community in general, okay? So um, you have to imagine, let's just say 60 years ago, if somebody died, you know, the most advanced imaging technology they had was x-rays. So they would do an x-ray of the head or the chest or the abdomen, and they would try to see what was happening. But ultimately, they had to go... Uh, had to have the pathologist go in there and look and see what happened. Well, now you've got high-resolution CT scanners, you've got MRI scanners, you've got interventional radiology procedures to assess um, for, you know, the the vessels, like if there are aneurysms and things like that. Um, You've got um, thousands and thousands of blood tests to, you know, look at and see um, what, you know, blood chemistries and things like that could possibly be going on. And see, I remember, you know, in residency, people used to get sort of very contentious about this. Well, you know, I mean, we're pathologists and and they can't do without us. No, I mean, here's the thing. I, I understand that technology has grown and uh, and I don't feel threatened by that. The reason why I don't feel threatened by that is because I've done enough cases where the doctors have missed the diagnosis with the most advanced possible tests already done and they missed it. And that's not, they, they didn't miss it because they're bad diagnostically. Uh, the, the doctor did not do a bad job. The test is simply not sensitive enough. The, the pathology, um, the autopsy is the gold standard, uh, for certain, you know, uh, injuries and, and certain, um, very fine, um, detail on some of these organs and some of these bones that you have to look at. So I don't get upset, but the point is you can find a lot of things with technology that makes the autopsy irrelevant in some cases. So this has driven down the clinical autopsy rate, um, which unfortunately has caused medical students and residents to have um, decreased exposure to this. And that's why a lot of young medical students don't have exposure to real um, hands-on pathology. I mean, a lot of them uh, don't, you know, know like what a kidney looks like or something, you know, in the flesh. It's it's pretty sad. Um, you know, I could kind of go on a tangent for that, um, and I don't want to make the medical students listening kind of like upset with me, uh, and because I don't want you to think that uh, that I think your your medical education is inferior because. You know, I went to medical school in the early 2000s, and by all means, um, you know, at that point, we also weren't seeing a lot of gross pathology in autopsies either. Um, I barely, uh, I, in fact, we didn't do an autopsy during the first two years, and the so, you know, um, that used to be a requirement. So by all means, I'm not trying to seem like I'm uh, cool and awesome. 
but I have had medical students in on autopsies um, because they used to take a autopsy rotation kind of as an easy um, rotation that they would take um, so that they could, you know, work like three hours a day and go home. And um, I would point out anatomy and a lot of them didn't know, you know, basic stuff like the abdominal aorta and stuff like that. And so, you know, um, I'm just, uh, I would like for people to be able to be exposed to the, the in the flesh anatomy, like while they're medical students, that's a bit of a tangent. And so I think that there's utility for the clinical autopsy, although the diagnosis can be ascertained by radiology very easily, um, and other testing, I feel like, you know, uh, there's an educational component that's being, that's lacking right now. Of course, I'm digressing because we're here to talk about how to avoid autopsies, um, not how to get more of them. So the, the other is forensic autopsy. So we talked about clinical, now forensic autopsy. That's what I do. I also do clinical autopsies, but, you know, I'm mostly a forensic autopsy uh, medical examiner. Now, forensic autopsy, this is broader. This is death usually occurring outside of the hospital. So this would be accidents, suicides, murders, natural deaths, um, any death suspicious of foul play or having um, like a legal component. So what I mean by that is any case that could end up in court. So think about something like a hit and run in a car. Somebody hit hits somebody in another car and they die um, or something where there's a life insurance issue, um, obviously a murder, something like that. That's going to be the forensic autopsy, okay? And it's different for different jurisdictions, um, not only state to state, uh, but county to county, even within the same state. And we'll probably do an entire episode talking about the differences, but uh, in short, there are two big systems in this country, in the, in the United States. I know there are people around the world listening to me. In the, in the United States, there's uh, two systems. There's the medical examiner system, which is a system more that's run through the government side of things. Um, and the medical examiner system, the, the chief has to be a board certified forensic pathologist that does all of the, um, kind of like authorizations and things like that. And then there's the coroner system. And there's a lot of confusion here because the, a lot of people think the coroner is a medical examiner. No, a coroner is actually a, an elected official and a, a coroner is on a ballot and people go on their election day uh, you know, if they go in person or if they mail, like if there's a, a mailbox for them to actually go put their ballot in, which may not exist, but that's another story. Um, if, if you have uh, a coroner, you don't actually have to have any medical training. You, um, I, in, in my state, you only have to have a high school diploma. And um, anyway, coroner is elected. They verify the death. So the forensic pathologist might do the autopsy and then the coroner verifies the death. So it's really, they're the, they're the legal entity on it. And um, so my state's a coroner, um, but then other states around me, you know, medical examiner states. And, um, you know, it can differ even within certain states. Some states have a hybrid system. And like I said, uh, some counties have different tolerances based on uh, which, uh, which cases they might do autopsies on and which ones they might not do autopsies on. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Now we're going to get into the specifics of how to avoid being autopsied. So what is the absolute best way to avoid being autopsied? Well, don't be murdered. Okay. So I know this is, I'm being a little bit flippant there, but I practice forensic pathology in a way that when I receive a body, my number one thing to rule out is murder. And I know that sounds silly, but it is uh, what we call a never event. So you all have jobs. Um, you know, anybody who has a job, there's a, the one thing at your job that you can't miss, that you can't. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're a healthcare professional or if you're, uh, it doesn't matter what you do. There's always that one thing that is the one thing you can't screw up at your job. Well, 
at my job, you're supposed to never miss murder, right? And, and all around the country, there are medical examiners who have cases that are murders. And of course, they slip through the cracks, whether it's because, you know, the, the, the assailant, the perpetrator is just that good and managed to pull it off. But you hope, you hope to catch them all. But of course, no one's perfect. Um, I have to assume every case is a murder. And of course, every case is not a murder. Uh, but I treat everybody that comes across um, into my morgue as this is a murder. Then I examine the body. I talk to the police. I talk to the deputy coroner. And then each little piece of information that I get makes me feel one way or the other. Okay, so was the house locked? Yes, the house was locked. Okay, now I'm feeling a little bit better. Uh, you know, did the person leave a suicide note? Well, they did. They left a suicide note and they fed their cat. Okay, so now I'm feeling a little bit better. And, um, you know, then they they left uh, their will and blah, blah, blah. Okay, now I'm feeling a lot better. And then there was a gun found next to the bed. There was one round in the chamber. And then the bullet was found in their head. Uh, the x-ray showed that, okay, now it's a hundred percent going to be a suicide. So, you know, that's what, that's how I treat every case. And, um, and it doesn't matter if it's a natural, an accident, everything. I always start with, this is a murder. And then I work backwards. Sometimes I end with, it's a murder, but that's why cases have to be autopsied initially. So don't, first of all, don't get murdered and you won't come for that reason to begin with. But in all seriousness, um, what is murder? Of course, that's, that's what the legal term we call homicide, death at the hands of another person. And that is a crime in essentially all cultures around the world. And, uh, for at least the last couple thousand years. And, uh, as such, it has to be investigated by an autopsy. Um, these autopsies are done meticulously because all of them, essentially all of them will end up in court if you can tie it to a perpetrator, to an assailant. And, um, that is, you know, in effect where the term forensic comes from, you know, the Latin word that, you know, from which it derives forensic is related to the word forum for forensic forum. Um, it is a place of assembly because what would happen is um, everyone would have to gather publicly in, in a public forum at, for a trial. And that's what would happen to determine murder cases is that everyone would come to the forum and then the evidence would be presented. And then, you know, people would decide if there was guilt or not. And so that's where the, you know, the term forensic initiated. And, um, and so when people say forensic pathology, everybody automatically assumes that all I do is murder and it's not true. I mean, obviously that's the minority of cases that I do, um, probably, you know, less than 5% is going to be murder. Thank goodness. Or I would never sleep. Um, but you know, the, the other question is people, and, and this is, uh, especially with, if you go back to my first podcast and we talk about Floyd that was murdered and essentially on tape, um, you know, and, and other cases too, people will, they get very angry and they're like, well, why was an autopsy even done? This is the stupidest thing in the world. Why did the pathologist even get paid? This is taxpayer money. This is ridiculous. You know, I want my money back and I, I employ the pathologist. You know how people are. They're always employing everyone because they're the taxpayer. Um, anyway, the, the idea is, why do you investigate an obvious death? Well, the answer is that eventually it is going to go to court, and any detail that can be used by the defense will be used to defend the case successfully. And so the forensic pathologist meticulously examines every detail of that body, head to toe, to look for anything chemically in the toxicology, to look for anything in terms of natural death in the body, to, you know, explain away some kind of symptom or some kind of reasoning for the death, to uh, explain away uh, any kind of theory the defense can come up with for how the body may have died another way. This is why we do autopsies on, on very obviously murdered bodies, 
we have to create the story so that they're really it's indefensible um you know it can't it can't be um you know the person can't uh, get off so to speak um a really competent autopsy you will be able to take the autopsy report and then you really can paint a picture with it and nothing is left out. And as I pointed out with the Floyd case, that was a really excellent autopsy report. Everything was covered. So when you hear people, um, and I see this every time there's an obvious uh, death in the, um, in the news and they do an autopsy, there's always like, if you read the comments or if you read YouTuber comments or something, there's always people that are, why are they even do an autopsy? This is ridiculous. Well, it's because if you want justice, you have to have all of your I's dotted and your T's crossed. That's just the way it works. Anyway, so that's, so number one, you want to avoid an autopsy, don't get murdered. Number two, step two is don't die suspiciously. Now, suspicious doesn't always mean murder, okay? What we mean here is if the body is is found when the cause of death is not immediately obvious, okay? So this doesn't mean murder per se, but if you were to be found, let's say, in a parked car, and uh, you might be bird watching, for instance, just in your parked car, but, uh, you know, if you're, my, you might have also been doing drugs or you might have been strangled. We don't know. The police doesn't know when they find a body in a parked car. The pathologist doesn't know. And the, med- the medical legal death investigator or MDI um, in, in coroner states, they're referred to as a deputy coroner, um, they're going to do the, um, the initial workup. The police do an initial workup and then they have to do an autopsy in cases where it looks a little bit suspicious because if there's even you know, 5% doubt that this could be something suspicious, the pathologist has to sort that out. Is this, and could it be a staged, here's the other thing, could it be a staged case where, okay, this is a body in a car, but did that body die in the car or did it die somewhere else and somebody put it in the car? And so, you know, there's a lot of different variables here. Um, So, you know, uh, this, uh, for instance, a case we had, we had a, um, I forget when this was, it was at least a decade ago, but we, it was a submerged car, uh, that where it was, a there was a, a kind of an elevated road. It was a Creek, um, very common in Indiana, lots of little creeks running along the roads. And there was, um, 50 something year old woman that had been gone missing weeks and weeks and may have even been months later. They finally found a car with a woman in it. And she had been missing. And so, you know, uh, finally we find this uh, car with this woman in it. And she's badly decomposed. I mean, you can barely tell uh, that it's even uh, a human. You know, because at that point, underwater, you get lots of changes to the fatty acids. You get this substance called a dipasir. And they basically just sort of look like a mummy. Um, there's a lot of animal activity from, you know, like fish and all sorts of crawdads and things like that. And so you have to identify the body with dental records and things like that. And there was uh, no significant trauma really. Um, But, you know, we had to at least consider that this was in fact a uh, situation where somebody had, uh, you know, run her off the road or perhaps had uh, killed her in her car, something like that. But in fact, um, we were able to examine the heart. We found a severe calcified atherosclerosis in the coronary vessels uh, of the heart. And so most likely what happened here was you had a situation where she had a cardiac arrhythmia while driving and, um, you know, went off the road. There was no other explanation for her death. And, um, you know, it's surprising surprisingly common situation unfortunately um is someone with bad heart disease who uh, develops a sudden cardiac arrhythmia and crashes that's why you got to be really careful when you're driving Uh, you got to watch other people um but anyway so so the next thing now that so we've got so far don't get murdered don't die suspiciously and by the way don't die suspiciously is 
probably one of the most common ways uh, people earn an autopsy because suspiciously is, is a loaded word, but suspiciously just means we can't figure out exactly what the situation is upon finding the body. So this could be somebody who dies in their apartment, who dies in their home, who dies in their car, who dies out in the woods, something like that. So, um, okay. So step three, uh, is don't die. Uh, (laughs) this is, uh, easier said than done, but, um, law enforcement related deaths. Okay. So yeah, uh, that's a, that's a sensitive topic, isn't it? Um, because obviously these are, these are problematic because anytime you die via, um, police officer or, or while in custody running from a police officer, um, you know, while in jail, stuff like that. I mean, these are never without controversy, even if they're done perfectly by perfectly, um, biased, unbiased, um, individuals. Um, there's always going to be conspiracy theories. Um, I, I can't tell you how many people have, um, said, please, please do the Jeffrey Epstein (laughs) autopsy thing. And, uh, I'm not even going to go there at least in season one. Maybe I'll do that sort of, uh, in a celebrity season or something like, like that. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to get into any celebrity autopsy stuff until later, at least not that one. I've got my opinions on it, but, um, uh, that, you know, that's a death in custody because that one occurred in prison. And, and, and the truth is we actually see a lot of prison deaths. Um, and we, we do this because these are very, um, I, what's the word I'm looking for? These, when, a, when a person dies in prison, they, they often, uh, the prison gets sued. The, um, law enforcement agency gets sued by the family. The person could die from choking on a hot dog. It doesn't matter. The family can sue the correctional agency for very large sums of money. So the autopsy is done, um, to, you know, kind of make sure that there's no foul play and things like that. I don't know how those cases come out in terms of monetary Um, I don't, uh, I don't participate in that. I never go to court on those. I only do the autopsy, but, um, an example of why these cases are important. Um, you know, first of all, you cannot escape the conspiracy theory aspect. And I'm not talking about the Epstein stuff. I'm talking about families, perceptions of things that happen, um, loved ones, perceptions, Um, you can never, you're never fully going to trust the situation. So you can't escape that. All I can do as a pathologist, and I'm actually independent. Um, I do not work for a government. I, I actually work for myself. Um, I am a very, in a very unique and unusual situation. Um, I don't know. I haven't put that up on my YouTube channel or anything like that, but I always get people who um, they sort of angrily, they're like, uh, you're working for the government and you're, you're, you know, an agent and all this stuff. The thing is, I actually own my own business. I'm a private contractor. Um, I am my own employee. I am essentially my only employee. I do have two assistants that I um, pay to do autopsies with me. Um, but yeah, because I'm in a coroner state, I contract. I am a private contractor. So um, if anybody, yeah, that this is an unusual situation because there are only 500 board certified forensic pathologists in the country. And of those 500, most of them are working as medical examiners, uh, which work for government entities. So I am one of the very few private contractors um, in this entire uh, United States so that's just a little so- aside. So if you ever hear somebody say, uh, you know, Dr. Wolf, uh, I don't know about that guy, man. He's working for somebody. No, I'm not. I, I literally work for myself. I have no friends. I just stare at the wall. So anyway, uh, I want to tell you about a case that's really interesting, and I'm telling you about it. Um, it's actually not a case I did, but it's a case I participated in um, as an observer 
And a uh, really interesting case that was um, a police-involved case, and it looked really suspicious. And uh, and it's sad because I know the family probably to this day will never believe the result. Um, but at any rate, so a young man had, uh, he was running from police, and by running, I mean he was actually driving a vehicle. I think he had robbed something, and police were chasing him, and he got to the point where um, he had gotten cornered. And, um, he was in his vehicle and the police surrounded him and there were many, many police cars, guns were drawn, um, bullet, uh, is fired from the, the, the young man's vehicle. And by young man, he was young. He was like 16 or 17 years old, bullet fired from his vehicle toward the police and per routine police open fire, um, aggressively, um, you know, many rounds fired into that car and of course the young man dies. Um, he's, he's full of lead. I mean, you know, many gunshot wounds. I don't know. Uh, I'm estimating something like 20 gunshot wounds. And, uh, so we do the autopsy and at any rate, we do the autopsy and we come to find out that this kid actually killed himself. He was surrounded by police and we found a contact gunshot wound to his head. And what happened was he put the gun to his head and the driver's side of the vehicle was facing the police officers. So he put the gun to his right temple, pulled the trigger, bullet passed through his head from the right side, out the left side of his head, through the glass of the car toward the police. So he was dead. Uh, but the police, of course, with their guns drawn, they thought he was firing on them. They unloaded on him. And, and of course, you know, obviously they, they hit him. They filled the car with, with bullets and they, they filled him with bullets. And that's a situation where the autopsy absolutely tells the story. The story was, this was a kid, a uh, really unfortunate situation on a suicide mission. You know, I mean, he had robbed something. I don't know. He had maybe done something else. I wasn't sure the the complete situation, but he had decided once he was surrounded that he was going to kill himself. And once he, and I don't think he intended for a bullet to go through his head toward the police. He just, he just killed himself. And that bullet happened to fire at the police. Didn't hit any of the police, but as you know, if you fire on the police, you're going to get fired back on. So that is a really unusual um, police involved action or police action uh, shooting case. And so anyway, that's sort of a, a morose and, and sad case. But the point is any law enforcement involved case, whether it's you're being chased by police, you're, you're firing on police, you die in custody, you die in a prison, and it doesn't matter. Like I said, you could be eating lunch, you could have a heart attack, you could have pneumonia, um, you could have in-stage in AIDS. It does not matter if you die in a prison, you are going to get autopsied. Um, and so hopefully most of you can avoid um, dying in prison. But anyway, um, that's just an aside. That's an, that's an always autopsy, um, at least in my state. I've I think we've always autopsied those Maybe there are other states who don't. I can't speak for the 49 other states. I only work in one state. Um, I do legal work in other states, but I only do autopsies in one state. All right, step four. So we've got three steps down now. Step four is don't die while at work. So uh, yeah, regardless of how you die, these deaths have to be investigated because of OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So what is OSHA? They ensure safe work conditions for workers around the country. Now, OSHA is something that was created in the 1970s. So the late 60s and the 70s were very big on like, you know, worker conditions, clean water, clean air, um, things that, you know, th this is, these are things that we take for granted today, but that, um, you know, things that are regulations that are important these are why regulations are sometimes important for um, industries and business. And so OSHA is very serious about having um, safe, safe work environments. So if somebody dies at work, you have to autopsy them because OSHA is going to get involved. And uh, naturally, they want to know, was the workplace procedure 
or anomaly at at the root of the cause of the death. And the family, of course, wants to know, was this, you know, the family wants to know, are we going to sue? Because if the workplace is involved, the family may have a, a liability, um, you know, claim there where they're going to hire a lawyer and sue the business. So if the workplace is at fault, uh, then, you know, obviously the company is going to want to try to avoid a lawsuit. So the autopsy helps kind of everyone in that situation. Um, if there's no autopsy, then it's conjecture. If there is an autopsy, then, you know, you're going to know for certain. Um, and I actually see this a lot. I, I see um, a lot of deaths at work. It's actually quite sad. But, um, you know, a lot of times it's natural deaths. Now, I do see trauma. I do see um, construction workers and, and farm workers, a lot of farm workers, unfortunately, people who die in heavy machinery and things like that. And, um, you know, it it's not necessarily, I don't ever say it's the fault of the worker. I never ascribe uh, the cause in terms of the machinery. What I do is I describe the injuries and then I let the investigation put together the autopsy report with the investigation of machinery and things like that and the conditions to decide whether or not there was um, uh, some kind of fault. But oftentimes when deaths occur at work, it's simply just like a heart attack. You know, it's somebody who just uh, went to work and had a pulmonary embolism or a heart attack or a cerebral hemorrhage. And if that happens, of course, um, you know, this is a situation where OSHA is, they know that it wasn't a, um, you know, a workplace um, related issue. It wasn't a uh, procedural issue. It wasn't a, um, a problem with, you know, how the, the business was operating. There's going to be less of a liability issue involved with that. So don't die at work. Um, I know that uh, I personally would really not like to die at work because my work is full of death and that would suck to die in a morgue, although it would be very convenient, wouldn't it? Um, so step five, um, this one is this one's a coin flip, but this one's don't kill yourself. Now, I say that because um, suicide, while it's very tragic, um, not all jurisdictions um, investigate suicides the same way. Um, some places do su all suicides. Some places only do violent death suicides. So gunshot wounds, for instance. Um, and I, again, I can't speak for every single jurisdiction. Um, I feel like the area where I work and I have a little area carved out in Indiana where I do autopsies, uh, almost all the suicides seem to be investigated with autopsy. And, uh, but again, not concrete. Um, but you know why, I guess the question I always get is why would you do a suicide if it's very obvious? Well, okay. First of all, there's a couple of different reasons. What's the most common cause in my practice of suicide? What is the most common thing I see? Well, it's a gunshot wound. And it's um, almost always a gunshot wound to the head. And um, among gunshot wounds to the head, it's almost always an intraoral gunshot wound. That's the gunshot wound in, the, you know, a gun in the mouth. And then second would be a gun to the temple, just right to the, you know, to the side of the head. And then third would be a gun under the chin. Um, so, yeah, kind of gruesome, but a gunshot wound to the head so it, let's say you've got a, a person and the very common situation is someone home alone, um, you know, um, residence is locked. Maybe there's a suicide note. We're going to do like a lot on suicide because we see so much of it. I, I, I don't like talking about it, but it's important to talk about it because it's so pervasive in our, in our culture and not just our culture, but in all cultures. Um, so I'm not going to talk about everything suicide right now. Uh, but just real quick, um, suicide notes are not common with suicide, but let's say you've got a person who shoots themselves and they leave a suicide note, apartments locked, 
and they were known to be depressed and maybe weren't taking their depression medication. Um, that's a very obvious case, right? Why would you why would you autopsy that case? Well, the answer is this, and this is what how I was trained, is that if they used a gun to kill themselves, how do we know that that gun wasn't used for a crime, for some other crime? Because what can happen is you can go and you can actually retrieve that bullet from the head, usually if it's in the head, sometimes it passes through the head, but you can retrieve that bullet from the head, clean the tissue off of it, and then save it in a container. And if it turns out that that gun was used for a crime at some other time, perhaps even a homicide, then you can go and you can take that bullet, you can compare the markings on that bullet, and you, then you can say, aha, this gun was used as a crime, uh, for a crime at some point, and then you can maybe make a connection with it. So that's why suicide used guns, um, that's why we sometimes use, or sometimes um, perform autopsies on suicide cases like that. And so it's a long uh, explanation for a very simple thing. Um, but yeah, that's that's why we do that. Now, okay, what about hangings? Hangings would be the second most common cause of suicide that I personally see. Um, yeah, and so basically with the hanging, um, hangings are are very common because they're, they're usually, I mean, for people who don't have a, a gun readily available, they have a, an instrument of hanging that they can use a, you know, a rope or a belt or some kind of implement that's, you know, in their house, a, a cloth or something like that towel. And so that's why, um, I think you see a lot of hangings. And so w hangings are all very often unwitnessed. I think shootings, um, gunshot wounds to the heads and things like that are much more frequently witnessed. The hangings are very commonly unwitnessed. Why? Because if they're witnessed, somebody's going to run over and cut them down. That's why. So um, if they're unwitnessed, um, they typically are autopsied to ensure that there's not something funny going on, like um, uh, what we call a staged scene, where you have a um, case where somebody might be strangled um, and then hung up to make it look like a suicide. So that's the classic reason to do a um, autopsy for a hanging. Although many uh, jurisdictions don't, they'll do what's called an external exam. So if it if it's a really obvious story, and it's um and it's a um, very obvious um you know ligature mark, then they won't do an autopsy. I've worked in um, areas that have done both. And then you've got things like jumping, jumping off buildings. Um, you know, that's a common thing, uh, probably the third most common, um, along with ODs. So with ODs, um, not everybody, you know, takes injectables. Uh, a lot of people just swallow pills. So the only way to ascertain whether or not they've swallowed pills is to actually open the stomach and you can't get to the stomach unless you do an autopsy. You have to physically open the body to get to the stomach. So that's why, so all roads lead to odd top autopsy if you're uh, concerned about a suicide in that case. So yeah, that is, um, unfortunately step five is don't kill yourself. It's, a uh, unfortunately, you know what? Um, I've got some data that I'm looking into on this right now, but, um, I have seen in 2020, it feels like an uptick in suicide cases. And there's been some question about whether or not this is related to the uh, just, you know, 2020 has not been the best year, right? So I'm, I'm having an assistant of mine run the data and I'm going to see if there is an uptick compared to previous years. I will report back on that um, hopefully in a future episode. Stay tuned. All right, so we're getting closer to the end here. Um, step six of avoiding the autopsy is don't die in an accident or with some kind of weird injury. So, um, as I said, cause in the cause and manner of death episode, an accident is a broad term. We're not talk. We're not just talking about a motor vehicle accident. We could be talking about an electrocution, a fall from a ladder. Um, something like a carjack giving out and a vehicle falling on top of a person, 
Um, but of course, you know, the motor motor vehicle accident is probably the most common. Um, and then the other thing is we can't forget in the accident category would be the drug overdose. Uh, most drug overdoses are classified as accidents. So, you know, we have to, uh, we have to remember that, um, these are, uh, in these cases, we, we have to do autopsies because there could be situations where uh, criminal charges are involved. At first, they look like a simple accident. Let's say you have a car accident out on the road, and okay, so somebody ran off the road and hit a tree. And then you find out later they were run off the road by another vehicle. Or maybe there was another person in the car, and then they they ran off because they were drunk and they crashed the car. You know, I mean, there's a, a multitude of situations you could come up with here. Um, but of course, you also have to think about um, situations where the injury um, and death can be separated in time. So let's suppose you've got a situation where a man is injured by faulty machinery at, at his job and he isn't provided with, uh, you know, safety equipment and he's paralyzed somehow. And then years later, he develops pneumonia because of his paralysis. So if when you're paralyzed, you can't move your diaphragm. And when you can't move your diaphragm, you're gonna, your lungs are going to be basically unable to move air very, very well. When you can't move air very well, then bacteria can build up and then you get pneumonia. Well, then pneumonia, of course, is a very common cause of death for people who, you know, can't move air. And uh, therefore, it is... Uh, labeled an accident related to the original injury. So um, that is a, another thing that people have a hard time with in forensics is that um, the manner can be, you know, the incident can be far in the past. They can be separated in time by decades, actually. And I'll probably do an episode on that in the future. Um, not sure where I'm going to fit that one in, but um, it's there's some really neat cases, some famous cases um, that deals with that. But the idea is um, dying in an accident or some kind of violent injury is uh, definitely autopsy material because there's always that cho- that chance that there's going to be some kind of criminal charges. Um, you know, just of note, um, and this is kind of like as an aside on that, you know, dying uh, um, on public grounds. Um, dying in a business as well <laughs> um, can also buy you an autopsy because today it's all about lawsuits. It's all about avoiding lawsuits, being protected from lawsuits. Um, it's a very litigious, um, litigious society, right? That's that's America for you. So a lot of the autopsy stuff is driven by um, being protected by uh, you know from being sued. So, um, you know, when we talk about accident, you start thinking about like personal injury attorneys and things like that. So, uh, and there may even be some listening to me right now. So give me a call anyway. Um, step seven. And now this one is also, this is a very, um, common forensic autopsy and that's the sudden natural death, especially if you're young. Okay. So this is the um, probably overall most common autopsy seen in the country and around the world. And um, this is this is uh, like this is where the fear comes from, just like waking up and wondering what's going to happen every day, because there there are people out there who go for a run and they don't come home. They just fall over dead. Um, You can't um, unfortunately, you can't uh, dwell on things like that, but. But there are cases like that 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 keep medical examiners um, keep them going every day, and I see tragic cases every year. And basically, talking about sudden cardiac arrhythmias, brain aneurysms, heart attacks, pulmonary embolisms, and these cryptic hidden diseases where symptoms suddenly develop and person falls over dead, um, often dying during activity. You know. Um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of these are young people who, let's say, uh, they're running, they're playing basketball, things like that. I don't see it commonly. Um, thankfully, only once or twice a year. But if you if you extrapolate over that age group across uh, a state or a region, 
Um, there are, you know, um, certainly uh, a number of cases that occur. That's why it's good to, you know, get checked out at the doctor. And sometimes I think that um, certain cardiology groups will even offer ultrasounds and things like that to um, um, cardiac ultrasounds to ensure that there's not like thickened heart walls and things like that. There are genetic um, related arrhythmias, uh, which are very uncommon, but they do occur. Um, but, you know, anything that involves sudden death, these are more common in older people. Don't get me wrong. We're talking about uh, a man who hasn't been to the doctor. He's 47 years old. Um, perhaps he's a truck driver. He drives from North Carolina to Michigan. Um, he's a smoker. He gets out at a truck stop and he falls over dead. And then you autopsy him and you find a huge pulmonary embolism. That is pretty classic um, forensic autopsy right there. It's also a classic history too. Um, it's not that you can do it without the autopsy because sometimes they do have heart attacks in that situation. But when I get a history like that, before the knife even even hits the body, you can almost predict what it's going to be. Um, but anyway, uh, there there are other situations um, that'll buy you an autopsy, and and we will we'll hit all those um, eventually. And I mean, some of them are things like childhood deaths, for instance. But I'm not going to say, hey, you know, don't die as a child because I'm pretty sure that you know, as a child, you're not listening to this. Um, deaths during medical procedures. Um, generally any death where a doctor won't sign the death certificate. I mean, that's ultimately the big obstruction that, that will trigger, um, an autopsy is will the family doctor, will the primary care physician sign it? And what that means is, uh, does he or she feel confident in the cause of death? Um, if not, then the pathologist must find the cause of death. And that's, that's really what happens. And so, you know, as we finish up this episode, what's the best death to have to truly avoid an autopsy? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, have you ever even thought about if you would want an autopsy or not? I know that I, I have a couple of friends who have said to me, oh, I absolutely want an autopsy or, or I absolutely don't want an autopsy. Um, I don't know why anybody would really want to think about that. I mean, for me, it's, it's my job. So, you know, I mean, I, I have thought about that, but, um, it's not something that, uh, normal sane people think about, but maybe you'll think about it now that I've talked about it. Um, I would say don't be murdered. Uh, don't kill yourself. Don't die in an accident. Don't die at work. Don't die on public grounds or in a business. Don't die unexpectedly. Don't die young. <laughs> instead uh, it's best to live to a very old age and with some well-documented medical conditions that will allow your doctor to easily sign the death certificate and this of course uh, is going to vary jurisdiction to jurisdiction so that's really what it comes down to is uh, uh, you know where you live I mean some people defer on autopsies that most jurisdictions would absolutely autopsy um, and, uh, in if you, it's kind of interesting, but there are some medical examiner offices and coroner offices where you can pre-register. Yeah. You can actually call and say, Hey, you know, I'm, my name is so-and-so and this is my date of birth and I'm going to pre-register at your office so that when you die, uh, it actually it makes the, um, process smoother. So I don't know. That's a little weird, isn't it? But I guess if you're doing death planning, that's something you can do anyway. So I am, um, that's all I have to say for this episode. I'm back after a little bit of a break there. It's been a weird summer. Hopefully, um, we can, you know, continue to put some episodes out this summer. Um, like I said, it's been really weird with, uh, how busy it's been and the pandemic and all this stuff. And I'll just try to put some more content out and just, you know, message me if uh, you have any questions and we'll go from there. All right. Thank you. <laughs>